Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 183 of the All Dolphins podcast. As you can plainly see from the gentleman at the bottom of the screen, and we are joined today by my good friend Chris Brown, uh, co-host of One Bills Live and also the Bills by the Numbers and, uh, and all-around good guy as well. Chris, how are you, my friend? Doing well. Good to be with you. We're going to have to verify that all-around good guy thing. Uh, <laughs> I always have some suspicion. when Yeah, it's probably not everybody. It might just be Alan. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm easy like that. Uh, before we talk all things Bill and the big showdown at Hard Rock Stadium Sunday night at 8.15 p.m., let's do our quick history lesson. And instead of a jersey number today, we're going to do the year 83 in honor, obviously, of episode 183. And 1983 was very memorable for Dolphin fans, obviously, because it was the year they drafted Dan Marino in the first round. And for those who have not seen it, check out a 30 for 30 documentary call from Elway to Marino. Oh, that thing is good. Oh, that thing is good, and it goes all behind the scenes. Um, and there's a Bills tie-in, not only the fact that Jim Kelly also was a first-round pick that year, but Dan Marino's first start uh, in the NFL came against the said Buffalo Bills. This came after he made his first appearance in a Monday night game against the Raiders where they got spanked. They were losing 27 nothing. Threw his first touchdown pass. Omar, to somebody who you should be very familiar with, you should know the answer very easily. Joe Rose. Joe Rose. Excellent. Following week, Marino starts against the Bills. Dolphins lose 38-35 in overtime, and Don Shula has a smile this wide from ear to ear after the game because we lost a game, but I got my quarterback for the next 15 years. So that's our quick history lesson. Let's move forward to 2024. It's almost going to say 2023. And the big, big showdown. Chris, first off, did you ever think – I know Omar did. Did you think – let's say when the Bills were 6-6, six and six, that the AFC's title would come down to this game on Sunday. Uh, it was talked about in Buffalo, for sure, because that was a scenario. P people start paper shooting here when it looks like a veritable disaster, and they say, oh, well, things got to get better in a hurry here. They're 6-6. Six and six. And uh, it was right after Joe Brady had taken over as offensive coordinator. They lost to the Eagles in overtime, 37-34, uh, and the only reason that happened was because Elliott hit a 59-yard field goal in a driving rainstorm uh, to force overtime. Uh, the Bills have lost games like that every way imaginable this season, some of the most uncommon outcomes you've ever witnessed in your life. They've taken place for the Bills almost seemingly all in this season. So I think Bills fans maybe blindly hoped that they could right the ship uh, they knew that Kansas City on the road, Dallas at home, would be the toughest games for the Bills on the rest of the slate that remained in front of them. But they essentially had to run the table and win the last five to ensure a playoff berth. They've got four-fifths of that done to this point. Mm. And, and I'm I'm very curious because uh, I know Ken Dorsey from when we were uh, – I covered the University of Miami, um, and he's been – uh, a, a person that I've monitored, followed throughout his career. Um, I was very surprised when he was let go um, by Buffalo. But it seems to have served as a catalyst for the offense in terms of changing that team's identity. What were, what was the reason for the dismissal? And also, how do you think the change impacted the offense? Yeah, I think, I think the biggest issue there was the offense was unable to correct some of the things that had been plaguing it pretty much since week five. And I think head coach Sean McDermott tried to give it as much rope as he could until the fortunes of the season started to be put in jeopardy, so to speak, because the consistency of the offense was costing them games or the lack thereof. And I think when things started to become inconsistent, not work, slow starts out of the gate for the offense, which put them in deficit situations, and then they're in scramble mode to catch up in a football game, and sometimes they could not. Turnovers were a part of that as well. I think Ken Dorsey, being the ultimate competitor that he was, would get frustrated and tight. And I think the trickle-down effect from that made the entire offensive roster tight as well, and it made it even harder for them to execute. And he was unable to change that dynamic within himself 
when things became difficult or inconsistent. Okay. And there was a trickle down effect that impacted the roster to the point where I think Coach McDermott recognized he had to make a change. So Joe Brady promoted from quarterbacks coach. And I think the best thing that Joe did right off the jump was to express to the players, hey, look, I trust you guys implicitly. I'm just going to draw things up that I think are going to help you succeed the most. And I trust that you guys are going to be able to execute. And I think he, being a younger guy, he's only 34 years old, I think he relates to the players a little bit better. I think there's more of a, I don't want to say loose, but there's a free and easy, energetic vibe to him that I think plays well with the players as well. And you could see it in the very first game. That was the second meeting with the Jets. It looked like everybody just exhaled on Mm -hmm. offense and they weren't gripping so much and they kind of took it from there. Now, that being said, it's not like this offense has not had some share of struggles under Joe Brady as well. They've had to grind out some games here the last few weeks because the execution has not been up to snuff. Some of the in-game adjustments have not worked as well as anticipated. So there are question marks coming down the stretch here with this offense even still. And one thing I've noticed since Joe Brady has taken over, and tell me if I'm wrong, a whole lot more designed runs for Josh Allen, which to me which seems like, duh, I mean, you have that massive weapon. No. Why are you shaking your head? Why are you shaking your head? I, I, I think massive. it's a recipe for disaster when you have quarterbacks scrambling and, and gaining yards. It's going to have the Cam Newton effect on his career. And it's That's gonna... fine, but you're not maximizing his full ability if you don't do that. Chris, feel free to win and tell Omar he's wrong. Well, I, I'll I'll say this. It was very clear the first half of the season that it had been drilled into Josh's head to not run. It was evident from the very first game of the season. He's rolling out to his left. He's got 30 yards of green grass in front of him against the Jets on an off-script play. And instead of running for 30 yards, as he has done each of his first five seasons, he heaves the ball down the field on a deep post, and it goes for an interception. Um, There were several examples of that in the weeks that followed. When the coordinator change was made, again, the season's on the precipice of disaster. The coaching staff, I'm convinced, I don't know this, but I'm convinced, basically said, we got to let Josh be Josh because we got to save the season. And... I think they know that if there is at least the threat of Josh to run, Mm -hmm. it puts the defense in far more conflict because now you have to make the decision, am I going to commit a spy to him? Now that's one more person taken out of the defensive coverage. Uh, There are other ways to try to defend Josh, but it puts a defense in supreme conflict there, whether you're at your own 20-yard line or whether the Bills are in your red zone, whatever the case might be, it makes the Bills significantly more difficult to defend. And we can get into this a little bit later, but really the receiving core has not taken that next step with some of the younger players in that group. And so I think Josh running more is almost a a by necessity thing that they've had to add to their offense because separation early in the down has been a persistent problem. So easy button answers for Josh to go to in the passing scheme have not been there on a consistent basis. So there are some issues with this offense even now coming down the stretch, despite the fact that they've been able to win games. This segment is brought to you by You Break Wheel Fix. You Break Wheel Fix is your complete wheel repair refinishing solutions located in North Miami. They've got over 25 years of experience repairing damaged wheels from cracks and bends all along any type of refinishing job custom brakes works, custom wheels, uh, you break wheel fix. If you say you got the, you got the number from all dolphins podcast, you save 10%. If you want to get some custom work done on your wheels, call Mark at 305-748-0112. Um, let, let's, let's, let's dive into a little bit more about this situation with, um, I get it. It changes the elements of the offense. It presents another threat. But do you not worry about Josh Allen's durability? I mean, all it takes is one hit. Yeah, that's true. Um, You know, and knock on wood, his only injury 
that he has suffered of any significance in his career from running was against the Patriots. I want to say it was either his rookie year or 2019. Okay. He did suffer a concussion, but he cleared protocol and played the next week. He's had a, he had a foot injury against Tampa back in 21, scrambling, got tackled from behind, guy landed on his foot. His foot wasn't great, played the next week. Um, the other thing is, most safeties and corners, if he gets that far down the field, smaller than him, they got a business decision to make, and they don't like that decision because uh, he goes about two forty-five. Um, so he yeah, it's tight end. No yeah, it's not. it's an issue. So uh, I think it's I, I think if Sean McDermott had his choice, he would say, yeah, let's not do that so much. But I think the offense, quite frankly, needs that element in it to make it an effective enough offense to score points, get ahead on the scoreboard, and close out games. Now, Chris, I, I say this all the time, um, and Allen is not a big fan of this, but I call Josh Allen the Dolphins' daddy. Um, he pays child support to South Florida because every time he comes here, he just absolutely owns this franchise, with the exception of his two losses, a drop by Charles Clay in the end zone in his rookie season, uh, and then – um, last year in the first meeting, he just ran out of gas through a incomplete pass on, on fourth, a dribbler on fourth down. Yeah, that's the one Bills fans like to call the sauna game. When the, basically, when he basically put the Bills in a sauna on the far sideline when it was 110 on the field and the Dolphins decide, yeah, we're not going to use our misters. So by NFL rule, the Bills could not use theirs either. Wait a minute, wait a minute. There's a rule that if Dolphins don't use their mister – the opposition won't can't use their mister either. That is correct. So the Holy dolphins crap. don't use that stuff on purpose because they're in the shade, man. So it's a 30 degree difference from one sideline to the other. And uh it's a well known fact that a lot of bills were throwing up at halftime, had to take IVs. Um, not to mention the fact that they were missing five defensive starters in that game, but that's another story entirely. Uh and yeah, they literally ran out of time. If if Isaiah McKenzie gets out of bounds or decides to run up the field, hands it to his center and spots the ball to them for them to spike it, Tyler Bass is on for a game-winning field goal on the last play of the game. And, oh, by the way, Josh threw for 400 yards in that game. Yeah, no. Um, child support, as I say. It, it, <laughs> Josh, Josh Allen is masterful, especially when he plays the Miami Dolphins. Um, do you think it's just confidence level or – does he really feel this? I mean, cause we've changed defenses so much even throughout his career. Right. I, you know, is it just that he feels like he owns this franchise? No, I think it's style of quarterback. It's a bad matchup for Miami and most other defenses, quite frankly. And that's why going into last week's game, I thought Lamar was going to have his way with the dolphins as well. Cause he's the same kind of quarterback. He can make so many things happen off script. He can extend the play. He forces defenses to account for his running ability. And Lamar did that whenever the hell he wanted last week, apparently. Um, I think there are ways to at least mitigate what players like Josh and Lamar do at the quarterback position. But more often than not, they have to help you beat them. And that's why the only time Josh does lose is when he turns the football over. He has to help you beat him. And, and this is where we need to point out, because Omar, there was one game where, where Allen did not play a great game against the Dolphins. That was in the playoff game. Because the Dolphins were were booty cheeks, as we like to say here on the All Dolphins podcast, on offense that day. And it was a 34-31 game because they got three takeaways along with a 50-yard punt return. And that kind of helped them stay in the game. Um, Earlier this season, however, it was 158.3 for Josh, as we all know, which is a perfect passer rating, which is what Lamar Jackson got on Sunday. Um, let me shift gear and then in my final statement to me, and I, and I get the durability issue with Josh Allen. If you keep Josh Allen in the pocket, you're preventing Josh Allen from being Josh Allen. And, and he, to me, then he becomes a good quarterback. He's not elite, top five quarterback in the NFL, top three, whatever you want to say, if you limit him to the pocket. Uh, Stefan Diggs also had a huge game against the Dolphins in the first meeting. Numbers are really, really mediocre 
uh, pedestrian over the last several weeks. Can Still a thousand yard receiver. Like I said, the yeah. numbers over the last few weeks, very pedestrian. What's going on there, Chris? Uh, this is just my personal opinion because the media has been peppering Sean McDermott mm -hmm. with questions because his snap counts are down as well. Um, they believe there's got to be something wrong with Steph. He's got to have some kind of injury, whatever, whatever. I just think he's tired. I just, I just think he's exhausted. Um, the main reason why I believe that is because they had to lean on him heavily through the first half of this season because they did not have other reliable answers in the passing game. Now, some have emerged since then, and I would put Dalton Kincaid in that category. I would put Khalil Shakir in that category. But the bottom line is Gabe Davis does not show up on enough of a consistent basis week to week. He'll have a big game once a month, but he's got – six games this season with one or zero catches six games that's not a number two receiver um khalil shakir is kind of finding his way and i think he can be a capable number three in his career but he has trouble against man coverage he's better against zone coverage dalton kincaid i think is the number two option in this offense and should be and I think he has a very bright future, but the fact remains, he's still a rookie. He's still learning on the fly. Um, and then Dawson Knox missed half the season with wrist surgery. So he's just getting his legs back underneath him here. If it was up to me, my receiving order would go Diggs, Kincaid, Shakir. And then if I'm going four wide, I'm putting James Cook outside because he's the most dynamic athlete on the offensive side of the ball for this team, and he is an accomplished receiver. Did it at Georgia, has done it here. Joe Brady has done a good job of incorporating him into the passing game more since he has taken over, and more often than not, he has come through for them, has had a few drops, that's been noted, um, but he is a dynamic athlete that they need to take more advantage of, especially with this separation issue that I'm talking about with the receiving core as a whole. But even Diggs, in my estimation, is having trouble with separation because I just think between his work ethic and the amount that they had to lean on him in the first half of the season, I just think he's tired. Yeah, and he's 30-year-old He's thirty year old now, so it, it's a different game. But let me ask you about James Cook a little bit. 1,000-yard uh, receiver, 1,800. 86. Total yards from scrimmage, yeah. And, you know, uh, and 426, 29 receiving yards, uh, scored six touchdowns. Did you expect this type of breakout season from a second-year pro? Uh, I was hoping for it. Um, full disclosure, my son is a undergrad at the University of Georgia, so I've been watching a lot of Georgia games the last few years, and I was over the moon when they drafted Cook, but – Sean McDermott makes you earn time on the field. He does not just hand jobs to rookies. He had a trouble getting on the field last year behind Devin Singletary, even though he was miles better from a skill set perspective. And even this year, they were kind of spoon feeding him slowly but surely. Latavius Murray was getting time, proven veteran player, but not nearly as dynamic as James. And then things started to increase as we got closer to midseason. And then with the coordinator change, it completely flipped. And Joe Brady said, this is our best guy on offense. He's got to touch the football. And then obviously he explodes on national television against the Cowboys for 266, 221 total yards from scrimmage. They ran for 266 in the game. Um, he's not perfect. He's still learning. Ball security has been an issue at times. Pass protection. Um, and while he's usually not put in that position, it's usually Latavius Murray who's out on the field. But I am all for putting him out wide as a receiver on third downs, and you leave Murray in the backfield to pass protect. He is that dynamic. Uh, let me flip over to the defense very quickly. And, and I know Omar is heartbroken that we won't get to see Jordan Phillips on, on Sunday because Omar and Jordan are very tight. Um, he's being f facetious, by the way. Okay. <laughs> Not a fan of Big Phil. All right. No, no, he's not a fan of me. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, because Omar questioned is uh, the consistency of his motor. Let's put it that way at one point, which okay. Was, Semi-valid, if we're going to be honest about it. Yeah. Um, he got cut later that year, in my defense, for the exact same reason. And, in fact, when I questioned it on radio, the uh, the head coaches came up to me and congratulated me and thanked me um, because they got an amazing practice for him. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, then he confronted me and wanted to fight. Yeah, that's not good. He's a big man. Yeah, yeah. that's a big dude. If we go back to the first meeting against the Dolphins – that's the day the Bills lost. Some nasty reverb here. No, I got we got an alarm going off here. There, I just closed. I had my broadcast partner close the door for me. Thankfully, I was going to say, well, if the building's on fire, if I feel free to, we'll we'll understand. Yeah, I'll let you know. Okay. Uh, so, the, in the first meeting, that's when the Bills lost Tre'Davious White for the year. The following week, in Jack against Jacksonville in London, they lose Matt Milano. Daquan Jones got hurt. He has come back. They made what to me was an absolutely brilliant trade in getting Rasul Douglas from the Packers. It looks to me like the Bills defense is getting close or closer to what it what it was or what it should have been. Fair? Not fair? Exactly. Uh, I would say the the turning point probably came in the Dallas game when you could feel confident in saying that Sean McDermott's unit has finally recalibrated from the losses they incurred in week five. Um, it's not like they just lost three players on defense. They lost an all pro corner who was their number one guy. They lost an all pro linebacker who was their biggest playmaker at the second level and maybe in the entire front seven. And they lost their best run stuffer who was number one in the league at the time he left the lineup in pass rush win rate at the one technique position. So, not just a run stuffer, but a guy who would penetrate. I think he had two and a half sacks his first five games, and then he also had like five or eight quarterback pressures through the first four games. So, um, yeah. Jordan Phillips there. Well, Jordan now is on IR. He's got wrist surgery. But, yes, he was still there through that portion of the season and kind of helped stem the tide. But, yeah, I think what you have now is a, is a unit that has recalibrated itself from those losses and now they are better overall i would say and douglas to your point alan was a, a fantastic pickup by brandon bean since he joined the bills seven games ago he leads the league in takeaways six in his last seven games including two last week and he tipped another pass that was intercepted by ed oliver last week uh, against the patriots so he had a hand in three of the four takeaways they had last week um the biggest difference, I would say, between the Bills that were run by Leslie Frazier defensively and the Sean McDermott play calling defense, more splash plays, more sacks, more pressures, more quarterback hits, more interceptions, more forced fumbles that are recovered. Um, they're giving up more yards, um, maybe not as good uh, against the run, maybe not as good on third down. Uh, in terms of getting off the field, but turnovers, sacks, quarterback hits, forced fumbles, uh, they've got those in spades. Um, it's funny that you mentioned uh, the Sean McDermott defense, and 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 I thought the change to Leslie for, from Leslie Frazier was going to lead to a decline in productivity, but obviously that necessar wasn't necessarily the case. But I want to ask about that hit job of a piece that was written earlier earlier in the season and I mean, there was a lot of damning information in that. But what you saw was the team sort of rally together and kind of support their head coach. It, is that at least that's how it looked from the outside in? Um, is is that what happened? Uh, I think that's probably a fair assessment. I, I think the team got behind coach in a big way, and. You know, they win that game. The next game was on the road at Kansas City. Not an easy place to play. And they got out a 20-17 to 17 victory. And, yeah, I think to a certain extent it galvanized the team uh, after that. So, yeah, I mean, maybe it inadvertently served a purpose uh, for the team. But, yes, I, because I think they believe that he was mischaracterized in a big way by a lot of, former people that were with the organization. And I think we all know that not all of them, but there's probably a handful that, you know, 
for the right or wrong reasons, have an ax to grind. Uh, maybe their career didn't pan out the way they wanted to here, and they're still a little sore about it. I get it. Um, I, I think the biggest disappointment from inside this building was that the writer of that piece never contacted the Bills for comment of any kind. And I don't need to tell you guys, that's journalism 101. Very, very well said. Um, interesting stat here. I was just looking, doing some research, which I don't, don't usually do, but no, if I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, Bills, Omar, scary, scary, scary number here. Uh, on a 13 game winning streak, regular season in December games. December, yeah, December and January. Correct. December, slash January. 13 straight. Mm. What gives? What gives it? Regular right. season, huh? You say? Yes. Yes. Because Sunday is a regular season game. So that. Uh, Ouch. Is there, is there a common thread there? Uh, I just think it's. McDermott and his coaching, uh, closing out seasons. I think there is a lot to his program and what he tries to do to make sure his team is crescendoing at the end of the season. Now, sometimes there are circumstances that get in the way of that and prevent the team from crescendoing as he would prefer. But 2021 was a great example uh, they lose to Tampa on December 14th, which I want to say was like week 14 or 15. They fall to seven and six on the season. They go on to win their last four games and play some of their best football of the year and annihilate the Patriots in the first round of the playoffs, 47 to 17, in what Bills fans refer to as the perfect game because they never punted. They scored touchdowns on every drive. Uh, every possession that they had. Um, and then unfortunately they have a gaffe at the end of the next game and lose to the chiefs in uh, the divisional playoff that everybody says is one of the best playoff games of the last 20 years. And then last year they lose an overtime game in week 11 to the Minnesota Vikings, which to my point earlier, they handed to them on a fourth and 18, the defensive back, instead of knocking the ball down, actually helps Justin Jefferson catch the ball to extend a drive, and the Bills get a turnover on their own goal line. All they have to do is kneel it out to win the game. And Josh and the center, Mitch Morris, mishandle the snap. It's not just a turnover. It goes for a recovery for a touchdown, and they lose that game in overtime. After that, they win their next six straight to finish the season and go to the playoffs again. Unfortunately, those playoffs, I will argue till I'm in the grave, was compromised by the DeMar Hamlin incident. I think they were emotionally yeah. spent going into the playoffs last year. That's why they played so, part of the reason why they played so poorly against that Dolphins team with a third string quarterback in Thompson and why they had literally nothing in the tank and were sitting on E when they played the Bengals the following week. But McDermott is an expert at getting his teams to kind of crescendo at the end of the season. I think that speaks to the record more than anything else. What, what do you think is the key to that for him? Because we, we've heard Mike McDaniel talk about that as well. Um, and it's something foreign to me because I'm not used to covering winning franchises, just being transparent yeah. with you. Um, <laughs> but, it, it, you know, outside of injuries, they were really trending up until, you know, the, the, the smackdown that the Baltimore Ravens just put on them and, and yeah. then they lose Bradley Chubb and, and lose Xavier Howard. So those are clearly going to be lost. Right. In the field. Yeah. And, and that's part of what I was talking about. There are some things that are out of your control, right? This is a collision sport. It's a 100% injury sport. Eventually, the injury bug is going to come to bite you for the Bills. To Alan's question earlier, it happened in week four and five when they lost three all pros in the span of two games. Um, actually, two quarters, if you think about it, because White got hurt in the fourth quarter and those two guys got hurt in the first drive uh, of the Jaguars game. So, yeah, and timing is everything, right? I mean, the Bills defense is the healthiest it's been in eight weeks. The Dolphins' defense might be as injury-riddled as it's been all season. Um, that can compromise whatever best-laid plans you might have. I will say that Sean McDermott invests heavily in the sports science end of things. 
Mm, um, another sports he, science guy. Yeah, big on the analytics. Uh, he has a sports science department that I think numbers six or seven, maybe even eight people here, and they they cut it fine here with load management, player rest, reps in practice, all of that stuff to get the best version of their players on Sunday, whether it's week one, two, or week 17 or 18. Now, again, I feel, despite all of those efforts, that Diggs can sometimes be his own worst enemy with his unrelenting work ethic. Yep. Seen and it, it wouldn't personally. surprise me if he fights some of that because he wants to be on the field, even in practice. Uh, he may have to take a long look at that going forward in his career because – like I said, I, I think he's just flat out tired right now. Mm -hmm. I, I, I do want to address um, Diggs. I've, I've dealt with him and covered him um, down here uh, in South Florida. Um, I, I there, How much truth do you think there is to a challenging, difficult, uncomfortable relationship that he's having with the organization and Josh Allen um, in terms of this playing out in the off season. Yeah, I think, I think it's largely overblown. I mm -hmm. think the narrative that exists in the media is not the narrative that exists in house. Um, I'll give you an example. So when the trade first happened and Diggs was acquired from Minnesota, Josh got on the phone, called him right away. He does that with everybody, draft picks, everything, offense, defense, special teams. It's just who he is. They then got on gaming system and, you know, they're playing Call of Duty. And every time Steph is wounded, Josh would run and give him, and I don't know these games as well as my son does, but he would run and give him health packs or whatever it is to bring him back to full health again. Every single time, like whether they had the chance to win the battle or whatever the heck it is, how it goes, because I don't play that game. He's coming and rescuing him every single time. And their relationship kind of took off from there um, because it's the same way on the field or in practice. These guys lead this team together. Watch, watch those two guys on Sunday during the national anthem. They will stand next to each other. They will like hold each other's hand for a second. I mean, those two dudes are brothers. Um, and I think that their relationship is as good as it's ever been. Now, what's happening in the passing game is something else, and they've worked hard to communicate and fix it because it's not what it was in the first half of the season. But those are two guys that are all about finding solutions together, not pointing fingers. Excellent. Chris, last, last question from me. Any reason to think that the Bills will attack Tyreek Hill any differently than they did in the first matchup? Um, this is a defense that's designed to prevent big plays. Uh, whether it will look exactly the same, I don't know. Um, but I think it's safe to say that they will try to muddy to his first look, get him to pat the ball, and rely on the pass rush to help the coverage because the pass rush has been outstanding uh, for the better part of the last six weeks. Ed Oliver has been an absolute animal. Um, he is the defensive MVP of this team, and it's not even close. Um, he is a he has reached game record status. Oh, okay. Oh. And that was kind of a long time coming for him, was it not? As a former first round pick, it was. And if you asked a lot of Bills fans back in the spring because they knew they weren't going to be able to keep both. Would you rather keep Tremaine Edmonds or Ed Oliver? Most of them said they'd rather keep Edmonds than Oliver because they, they've they seen too many times, Marcel Darius being the last example, of guys taking it out of gear once they get their bag of money. Um, and they were worried that if Ed got paid, he would take it out of gear too. And he had not shown the week-to-week -week consistency that we are seeing now. Ed is one of the few guys – big men, defensive tackles, who when he got his money was inspired and reinvigorated by it. He is playing out of his mind right now. He is a problem, a major problem. And with Daquan Jones back next to him, 
they're going to be an issue. And that's not even talking about Leonard Floyd on the outside and Greg Rousseau, who might be be one of the best edge setting defensive ends in the league right now in terms of the run game. Uh, uh, their defensive front is the strength of their defense. It's, you, you it used to be guy, their secondary AJ for years. It's flipped. You left off my guy, AJ Epinesa, who, who has yeah, AJ's coming back from a rib injury. Uh, did play last week for the first time. I don't know that he's a hundred percent, but he too is having a career year. Fortunately for him in a contract year. Good timing. Omar, anything else? I think I, is I, no, I think that's it. Again, I, we appreciate you for your yes. time, Chris. Can you tell the people how to find your work? Yeah, so we do a, a daily show, um, which people can find on buffalobills.com at the bottom of the page, re-racked every day there if they don't catch it live from 1 to 3 in the afternoon here. Um, but I usually link a lot of my stuff to my Twitter handle, at Chris Brown Bills. Um, yes, I still get comments because people think, I am the Chris Brown that once dated Rihanna. Just look at the avatar, people. It's not that Chris Brown. I am the other guy with the big, bald, white head. Please stop sending me videos saying you want to be in one of my music videos, all of that stuff. I am not that guy. I think you, they you think might, you, might, you probably should like some of the videos. I'm just saying. Well, you'd be surprised what I get, Omar. You'd be really surprised. I think they think like it's Chris Brown bills like this and it's just not. It's it's Chris <laughs> Brown true. Buffalo Bills. So <laughs> it's an unfortunate um misidentification of all things. So, yeah. All right. I just really appreciate the time, my friend. All right, take care guys. We'll see you Sunday. All right. Thank Hello. you for joining us. And that is it for All Dolphins Podcast. We will be back for a Hard Knocks recap. And then we'll carry you over to Wednesday's uh, availability where we got news on a laundry list of injured Dolphins players and who could potentially replace them. So see you tomorrow. Alan, hat tip for you, for the people. See you tomorrow.